75. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our next major milestone is 200 Patreon supporters. We are only 75 Patreon supporters away from achieving this goal and getting ever more closer to our overall goal of starting a nonprofit. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, all weekend warriors will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. And we have a special announcement. We have a new sponsor of the Patreon program, Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll receive 10% off your orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community. You'll be in the running for weekly Patreon giveaways, our monthly photo contest that we do every single month, and of course, members only content and so much more. If you would like to help Fishing the DMV grow bigger and better every single month to be part of a fantastic community that represents Virginia, Maryland, and the surrounding area, please check out the link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are here. We are the halfway point through April, and it's been an absolutely crazy April. I feel like every weekend the weather has been bad, and then it's beautiful Monday through Friday when everyone's at work. Uh, last weekend, I was actually down at Lake Anna, and it decided to blow about 180 miles an hour on the lake for two days straight. Beautiful weather if you just took away the wind. Uh, but hopefully as we get through here and later on into April, the weather will start uh maybe behaving a little bit better. We can actually get outside and enjoy some things. This 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 show is a little bit different than our usual Monday Night Lives. Uh, as you guys know that I'm on the Black Bass Advisory Board for Maryland. Uh, last week, we kind of did something with, with Mr. Captain Steve Chaconis talking about what's going on in Maryland. And then we followed that up with an episode on the smallmouth fish hatchery program that was in Maryland for the past five years and went through that. I thought that this is perfect to cap that off with Virginia and what has been going on in the tidal water fisheries as well. This is an absolutely awesome opportunity to get your questions answered live and to help incentivize this thanks to all of my sponsors. I'm going to be giving away prizes throughout the night to people that actually ask really good questions. I will pull them up on screen to get them answered. So ask a good question, you'll win a prize courtesy of Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. So without a moment ado, I'm going to bring on each guest one-on-one uh, -on -one or one at a time, uh, let them introduce themselves, and then we can kind of get going with this as well. Uh, so I guess we have to start with, you know, the man, the myth, the legend. He's been on the show about four or five times. Um, everyone knows him. Everyone loves him. John, how are you doing tonight, sir? I'm very well. Thank you, Thomas. How are you? I, I'm just so glad that we were able to make this work. Uh, this is, I'm really excited for tonight. I really am. Um, I, I think everyone knows you, but Cliff Note, who are you for the people that are listening that, that don't know who you are? Um, I'm a district fisheries biologist, work out in Northern Virginia district, been in the Fredericksburg office for a long, long time. Manage uh, with Mike Eisel. We manage the uh, the Northern district, which is Lake Anna, uh, north, um, you know, basically up to the urban jungle. And then we go as far west as Skyline Drive. So we have a really cool district in that we go from the mountains, the brook trout water, all the way to the tidal section. So we have a diversity of resources that keeps us busy, but we have a good time managing that. And then, of course, the snakehead thing fell on my lap in 2004, so we made some hay with that. I would also like to say that I think it took 34, 35 pounds to win at Aquaquan Reservoir, the first tournament of the year for that place. That place, the amount of seven pounders, and if I wasn't there to witness it, I would say you're lying. It's insane what that place is doing. I've been telling people for years the Occoquan Reservoir is the stuff. It, it's the best. When we rank our bass fisheries for a bass magazine for years running. It has been the number one in the state. Uh, you know, it's 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 extraordinary. It, it just it, and you, the the, the dang on Occoquan Reservoir for years was you could catch all the two to fives you wanted, and people complained and bitched about it. And 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 now all of a sudden, and I can't explain why the habitat hadn't really changed like it has in say the tidal Rappahannock or Lake Anna, but for whatever reason, I can't tell you why. And now those fish are all like, not all, but there's a lot, a lot of three to sevens and then some over seven. So it shifted up um, inexplicably, but I love it. Yep. Sometimes you just got to just smile on good fortune. Yeah. The next up on this all-star cast, uh, I get the first time on this on the show. And again, as always, you guys, you know, I'm terrible with names, but I always give it a college try. So Margie Whitmore, Margie, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. It's Margie, but good, Margie. really good effort. 
again, like just for the audience at home, just tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm the Tidal Rivers Fisheries uh, Biologist for Virginia. Um, so I kind of coordinate research and monitoring on all of our tidal, tidal rivers, uh, minus the Potomac, obviously. Uh, Region 4, which is John, takes care of that. Um, so yeah, I work a lot with bass. I work a lot of, with blue catfish, um, starting to work a little bit more with sturgeon. So pretty much whatever the manage, management priority is, I, I get to work on it and, and try to try to solve the problem. How, how long have you been in the position for? Uh, I just started in 2020. So this is going on my fourth year. Oh, cool. So still pretty new. It, it, is the sturgeon, that's such a, I haven't heard that in a lot of my conversations. How, how big of a, not a priorities, uh, probably the wrong word focus because that's just that's really interesting and a unique species to to monitor yeah so vcu has done a lot of the work with atlantic sturgeon and the james system um noaa has done and chesapeake scientific has done a lot of the work in the pamunkey um now we're kind of have a, a little bit of a handle on the james and trying to kind of spread out into other rivers and get a handle on those populations so um very early stages in that but um i'm looking forward to seeing that work progress and seeing if we can kind of get a better handle on the data and other populations. But yeah, again, very, very beginning stages for some other systems. Oh, that's going to be so cool to talk about. And again, guys, as always, you know, ask a question, you're going to win a prize. Uh, the third one to round out this trio, we talked a little bit to him actually at the Richmond Fishing Expo. I got him on for about 20 minutes. Now we can do a little bit more long form. Uh, he's a little shy, but let's give him a welcome. Scott Herman, how are you doing tonight, Scott? All right. How's it going? Thanks for having us all on. I get, same thing, like just give everyone just a little rundown that are watching right now. Who are you and how'd you get into this crazy thing? Yeah, it's uh, my name's Scott Herman. Uh, I've been working with the uh, Department of Wildlife Resources for uh, quite some time. She'd uh, March of 1998, not, not as long as Odenkirk, of course, but uh, and, you know, different uh, positions for a few years on Farmville, then up to Fredericksburg, and then as a fisheries biologist since about no, November of 2004. So Region one uh, out of the Charles City County office, basically keeping busy with a lot of the lakes and reservoirs and public resources from the James River on up to the northern neck. Mind you, we don't have too many lakes up on the northern neck. You got a few options up there, but most of the most of my action and uh, responsibilities are pro pr pretty much around, you know, Chickahominy Lake, Diaskin Reservoir, a lot of the uh, Newport News uh, municipality waters. You got Lake Chesney is pretty much one of my uh, higher profile uh, bass fisheries there. And and you know, been keeping busy the last few years on the Pianca Tank River as well as the Tidal Rappahannock below Port Royal. Ah, oh, there's so much. We're gonna make sure we get into all that tonight as well. Uh, for everyone listening right now, we got about 50 people kind of pulling in here. Uh, again, if you want to watch us on YouTube, that's the easiest place to leave comments. But we're also on Instagram, uh, Twitter. I'm sorry, X. I guess what it's called now, and about three different Facebook groups. Please share and like this out. It really helps out the algorithm. Basically, what we're going to be doing tonight, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation up on one of my other monitors here, and we're going to be going through it. And I think as I share my screen here, uh, really give a rundown, I guess, for people that aren't in the know on how these studies are conducted, just kind of like a, a mile high overview of how all this information in this data is collected. And I'm going to share my screen. Perfect. All right, cool. We got the screen up. Hopefully everyone can see it as we get into this bad boy. So yeah, uh, whoever would like to, to, to go about this first, uh, like how is this collected? So hey, Thomas, I'll step in here for a minute and just sort of give a, a sort of another, a secondary intro and then we'll hand off to Margie. Uh, she put most of these slides together, especially regarding the James system. But I, I think as, as we go through this, it's incumbent for people to, to sort of recognize that mo most of these data collections are long-term temporal data sets, which, which are very valuable for assessing the fishery. Um, and then the sort of unique thing about, you know, well, first off, let, let, I want to give a shout out to Marty for number one. It was her brainchild to be a little bit more proactive. It seems like a lot of times when we're given public presentations is because the fishery sucks for whatever reason um, and people are pissed. And, and so we end up sort of being on the defensive because people are saying, like, what's happening? What's wrong? We want you to stock because of this, that, or, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so we've been through a few of these meetings over the years and, and, and about a year ago, Margie, Margie, Margie decided, you know, Hey, it's a good idea. Let's be you know proactive about this. Let's get out. And, and if it's, whether it's good, bad or average, let's just tell people what's going on and, and what we're doing, what we're seeing and how we're doing it. So that brainchild resulted in February 22nd, I think it was the, the uh, first tidal bass summit. She dubbed it, which was a great idea and brought a lot of anglers out, tournament fishermen and just, you know, people that were concerned about the resource and got to hear about 
like, you know, the different tidal rivers in Virginia. The Potomac wasn't really included because that's Maryland water, although we do a lot of extensive monitoring in our tributaries of the tidal Potomac, which is kind of setting that aside for now. Um, but so depending on the biologist, you know, the by each biologist is up to a fair amount of his or her discretion to collect data as, as they see fit, you know, with input from the supervisor and, and you know, whatever. So not all of these data packages are the same. They, some of them were collected different means over different time periods, different methods. I mean, they all involve boat electrofishing, um, but in terms of the timing, the sequence, the amount of ROMs, all this is different, you know, but what we try to do is maximize the time we're on the water to get statistically valid information that allow us to make informed management decisions over time about the status of the resource. You know, ha what's the uh, reproduction? What's, you know, what's the abundance? Th these are the primary things that we're concerned about and anglers are concerned about because we work for the anglers. We want fishing to be good. Um, and so if it's not good, we want to understand why. And if it means stocking to get it better, then yeah. If it, you know, if it means we'll figure out how to do something with habitat, which in tidal rivers is pretty much impossible, but at least it's good to understand if there's a problem, then we can explain that and maybe either temper expectations or let the anglers understand what's happening. So to me, that that's a huge part of this. And then that you stepped in and, you know, we couldn't live stream that event in February. And you said, hey, what about a redo where we could kind of put some of this information out um, to people that couldn't make it to Bowling Green in you know late February? And that was a great idea. So thanks to you and thanks to Margie. We're here tonight. And so I just wanted to put that out there. And then I think as we go through, Margie's going to talk about a couple of the rivers that, that she's primarily, you know, working on. And then Scott's going to talk a little bit about some his, his experiences on, on a different system. And then we'll finish up talking about the Rappahannock. And, and you know, we, we could obviously go on for hours and hours and hours. But we're going to try to do move through it fairly fast and, and, you know, give you a sketch about what's happening. And most of it's pretty good news, uh, at least as far as we're concerned. So, yeah. Uh, and so I guess, Margie, do you want to start with, with uh, your PowerPoint? Sure. And and I just want to say that, you know, John makes some really good points about, you know, how these data need to be comparable. And a lot of my job when I came in here is, you know, kind of looking at all of the tidal rivers together is how can we kind of make it so these surveys are more comparable. Um, so before they were so different in every river, it was really hard to compare them to each other. Uh, and over time. And so a big part of my job the past four years has been to kind of standardize how we're doing sampling. Um, so that now we can kind of compare the work that John's doing above Port Royal with what Scott's doing below Port Royal um, and, you know, compare the York to the Chickahominy, et cetera. Um, so that being said, um, you know, I'm going to kind of go through these slides and um, they are going to be a little graph heavy. But um, one of the things I, I want you all to keep in mind is that and, and I'll point out on the graphs where it's happened is, you know, we had the sample design shift. Um, that on some of the graphs makes it look like, you know, numbers have tanked, but it's, it's, the numbers are good. It's just kind of a function of how the sampling design changed. So, um, yeah, great job kind of explaining that, John, because that is kind of a big part of, um, you know, how these numbers will present themselves. So, um, I kind of, these are mostly still the same slides from the, the Tidal Bass Summit that we had in person. Um, I, you know, this year was really us beta testing the idea. We had no idea what it was going to be like. Um, you know, we had a last minute venue change that made things like live streaming seem, um, crazy complicated, but I really think next year kind of knowing more what to expect and, and having a blueprint that, you know, would be more feasible, um, to do that. So, um, I want to thank you guys for this opportunity because as John mentioned, you know, being able to have open lines of communication with the anglers is huge. Um, I'm really big on transparency um, and kind of letting everybody know what we're doing and why. Um, so this is just a really great venue and I appreciate it. But um, all right, so I'll, I'll start running through the slides. Um, the first one is just the meeting outline, but um, starting with the James River, if you could pull up the first James slide. Yep. Um, cool. um, so again, we changed the sample design in 2021. Um, and you can kind of see that, um, I wish I had, a, I wish I had a mouse cause I, I like to point at visuals a lot. So, um, <laughs> I'm, I, I gesture, um, but so you can see how we, we separated out between adults and juveniles on that graph on the right. Um, and that's measuring catch per unit effort. And what that is, is how many bass we catch per hour of electrofishing. Um, so this is really an index that helps us compare, you know, population over time. 
Um, so you can see 2021, um, you know, you see these kind of very high adult numbers, very low uh, juvenile numbers, and that kind of yo-yos back and forth. Um, 2021 and 2022 were kind of wonky years. We were really just working on this transition into the new design. Um, and just for background, um, the old design was a fixed station design, and that meant that uh, the same sites or you know, group of sites would be sampled every year. Um, we changed that to a stratified random sampling de design. And that shift is so that we can um, more easily compare uh, samples. So when you're going to a fixed site that was selected because it has really good bass habitat, um, you know, you're, you're going to, it's biased, right? So you know you're going to get a lot of bass. And when you're getting a lot of bass, all of those collections are going to be biased towards larger individuals. Um, and so that's just human nature. We all want to see the big fish. It's exciting. Um, but it tends to underestimate the smaller size classes and especially the juveniles. And so if you're having an issue in the population, it can be kind of hard to detect it, especially with recruitment. Um, so kind of shifting to this random um, design, it means that, you know, because it's not biased towards really good bass habitat, um, you're going to see those numbers decrease. So you're going to see fewer adults. Um, the juvenile numbers are going to shift. I wasn't really sure how, how that would work out. Um, but it gives you a, an idea of what the whole population is doing because it's not biased towards good habitat. It's all habitat in the whole river. So it's, it's more of a general overview of the whole population. And, you know, when you see decreases in young of year or juveniles, then you know that that's kind of a really a, a good representation of what's happening in the population. So if you're seeing low numbers, then you know, that's, that's something to be concerned about. Or if you're seeing adult numbers tank, that's something to be concerned about. Um, but in and this I've, transitional... Oh, oh, I'm sorry to put you off. So I think we're going to do, since all the questions are pouring in, just to make sure that they're, since they are kind of with the topic, I will select a few questions and butt in every now and then, because this is an interesting one from Brandon. Brandon says, does the stocking of F1s affect the data? Brandon, do yes. you mean just because how many you put in there? Like a little bit more information would be great in the chat, but uh, anyway. So you, you'll see that in the in the next slide when we go into the, the Chickahominy is, you know, you will see how the stocking kind of bumped up those numbers in the short term, um, but kind of petered out in the long term. And that's kind of typical of what you would expect in stocking and in like a tidal system. Um, we don't expect really like a long term boost, more of a like a short term boost. And you're hoping to kind of have that contribute to the stocking um, biomass long term. But um doesn't always work out that way. Tidal systems are really finicky, as you know, y'all know. Um, but just kind of getting back to the to the James, um, you know, 2022 had Hurricane Ian, so that really threw a wrench in our sampling across the board. So 2023 was, you know, the first year that you know we had this we had this thing figured out. Um, the design shift was was kind of fully done, um, and we we got a lot of pedal time on all of the rivers. So. Um, you know, you'll see this in pretty much all of this, the the graphs for these rivers where, you know, 2021 and 22, low wonky kind of evens out in 23. And I expect, you know, going forward, we'll see those those trends, you know, be more representative. Um, so, you know, numbers pretty good in the James, you know, down for sure. Again, that could be just a remnant from the design shift, but the population is really good. We saw some really nice size individuals, a lot of juveniles. Um, the spring water temperatures from 2023 uh, were a little wonky. So, you know, going forward, we're going to do some more juvenile survey surveys just to make sure recruitment is looking strong. Um, but just looking at that size distribution, and that's like the number of fish per length bin. Um, and, you know, that those juvenile numbers are looking really good. So based on that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy um, and looking forward. Um, I'm optimistic. But um, the, the James has been pretty, uh, pretty steady. That's really uh, So cool. you can move. Yeah, so we can move to the Chickahominy unless anybody has any. And then yeah. we have a couple porn in. We're going to go with Everett. <laughs> Ever, uh, Everett, if I got your name right, uh, send me, uh, you want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle, please message me on Facebook, Instagram, or email me fishingthedmv.com to get that gift card. Uh, why did you change the sample design? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's it's a bit, it's like what I was saying before where it was, um, it's, it's, it's so that we can look at more population level changes and compare them both over time into different systems. So when we were doing the fixed station design before, you can really only look at the James River, you know, sample sites, you know, from 
you know, last year to this year, you know, kind of over time. But again, you're going to have those samples um, biased towards larger individuals. Um, and because you're doing the same fixed sites, you know, you, you kind of, you know, you might miss some things if something's off with a site, if you're sampling it at high tide or low tide, you know, that um, it might exacerbate differences in the results. Um, so having a, a stratified random sample, and John is way better at <laughs> explaining the, the stat side of this uh, than I am. Um, but it basically just, it, it helps you compare samples better over time into other systems without bias. And that's what we want, because when we see, you know, something going really well or really poorly in a system, we want to have trust in that result so that we can effectively manage these populations. Oh, perfect. Awesome. And then so let's move on to the next slide. Sorry about that. And then yeah, keep the questions coming. If anyone else wants to come off mute on the chat, because they see something that you want to talk about more the merrier. Um, yeah, so Chickahominy. So what I was saying about in the, the, the stocking is so the last stocking was in 2015 or 2016, I believe. And so you can see as you're moving closer to 2020, you can see kind of this big boost in adults um, that, you know, again, in 2020, um, that was the last year that we did the fixation design. And because the Chickahominy population is just always booming, that biased high uh, kind of size distribution, that effect is really strong in the Chickahominy. Um, so that kind of explains how that that big boost in adult abundance. And then when you're looking at it decreasing after, that's when we shift to the next design, right? So that's not an actual drop in adults. That's just, you know, us hitting less biased habitat. So, you know, when you're looking at 21, 22, and 23 in the Chickahominy, those are Again, Hurricane Ian in 2022, so we didn't get as much sampling in as, as we wanted to, but that's kind of the trajectory that that looks good to me. And, and I'm happy to see that, you know, 50, you know, uh, fish per hour is really good. Juveniles on the rise looks good. Again, 2023 um, water temperatures were a little bit wonky. So we're going to keep an eye on that. Um, make sure recruitment is still good. It's a, if you look at the size distribution, it's a little bit lower um, than we've had in the past for juveniles. Um, so again, you know, it's still a really good number. It's not something I'm worried about, but it is something that I want to keep an eye on because, you know, making sure that these populations are constantly recruiting and looking good is, you know, that's really important. We, we don't mess around with our tidal bass populations. Um, so if anybody has questions about that, um, otherwise I can, I'm going to go over a, a tagging project really quick before moving on to the York. Here we go. Perfect. Um, cool. So this is this project is a couple years old, um, but I want to touch on it just because this was an issue that was really big in the fishing forums. Everybody was talking about it. Um, I was hearing a lot about it, um, which was having tournaments go out of Osborne on the James River and go fish in the Chickahominy River, bring them back to the James and release them. And there was a lot of concern that this was kind of funneling fish out of the Chickahominy and decreasing that population. Um, you know, we were getting a lot of questions about it and we didn't have any answers. You know, we said, you know, the numbers are still good. We don't think it's affecting it. Um, but we realized we really don't have a number to put to that, you know, uh, what we, we're calling translocation. Um, so we did a tagging study. We tagged about 650 largemouth bass over 12 inches, like tournament minimum. Uh, we tagged them in the Chickahominy ahead of uh, the Bassmaster uh, out of Osborne. And then, um, also before the TBF Eastern Regional out of Chickahominy Riverfront. Um, we had a couple of different questions, one of which was, you know, what's the rate of translocation from the Chickahominy to the James River? Is it significant enough um, to impact the Chickahominy population? The other one was, you know, could this possibly be a dispersal mechanism for Alabama bass, which at the time, this was really the, the beginnings of the scare in the Chickahominy. Um, and so we were really concerned about them getting out of the Chickahominy, moving to the upstream James and affecting smallmouth populations. So, you know, we also wanted to see if this could be a mechanism for dispersing um, Alabama bass. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so first thing is we got a ton of reports. I think our rep reporting rate was like 18% which normally for, you know, anglers calling and reporting tags, it's usually in the single digits. Um, and a lot of that was because we reached out to our local anglers and they were really engaged in the project. So um, shout out to anybody who 
reported a fish because we had we had other fish biologists like not believing our reporting rates because it was so absurdly high. Um, so what we found through the project and like looking at the map, um, the color is, is of the dots is kind of meaningless, but basically the lighter the color, uh, that is the, the latest um, recapture that we got. So anglers would report uh, fish that they caught and we would kind of make note of the location. Um, and then on top of that, we were also at the weigh-ins for the Bassmaster Open and uh, the TBF Eastern Regional. Um, and we were collecting tag information from anybody that brought one in as, in their bags. Um, so we only saw 3.4% of our tagged fish come through these weigh-ins uh, as part of the, the tournaments. And outside tournaments, it was only 0.3%. Um, I was expecting at least 5%. Um, and we didn't even really come close. And so in order to start looking at something that might impo impact the population as a whole, you're looking at like above 10%, probably something closer to like 15%, depending on the system. Um, so this is a really good number. Um, I also want to say is we only had one Alabama bass come through the Bassmaster open weigh-in. And I don't even want to count it because it was an angler who knew it was an Alabama bass and terminated it and brought it in to, to, for a fin clip to, to DWR. And so it was actually a really good demonstration of you know, our guidance and our cooperation with angling clubs at work. So that was really awesome to see. Um, the graph on the right is just um, kind of a displacement distance. So the amount of distance between each relocation point. Um, so unsurprisingly, fish that were reported in the James, there was a lot more distance covered, right? Because they're moving from the Chickahominy to the James. Um, but the Chickahominy was actually higher than I thought it would be. Uh, and that's because, you know, the fishing pressure in the Chickahominy is high. A lot of the fish that were reported were actually caught and released multiple times. Um, hmm. So it was really cool to see. Um, I was hoping to kind of get at a pattern of dispersal after fish are released. But for a lot of the fish that were, you know, caught again and again, um, it was such tight time turnarounds that we can really get at a pattern of dispersal. Um, so... But what's interesting in general is that a lot of fish were, you know, released generally in the area that they were caught, except for a handful that ended up in the James and one that actually took a trip all the way to Osborne and then ended up back in the Chickahominy. I'm assuming that's a couple boat rides. Um, but it was really good to see that, you know, translocation wasn't really a big issue. Um, and, you know, the, the type of engagement that we got as part of the, this project. Um, so that's that. That fish only made that mo movement because he was probably caught again, correct? Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so a lot of times people will catch. So it, it, if they were released like above and below Osborne as part of a tournament, some folks actually will target, you know, release areas uh, during other tournaments. And so you see like there's one dot way up the Appomattox. Um, so there's also bass tournaments out of the Appomattox. So I'm thinking that, you know, some folks were maybe targeting areas in the vicinity of release sites, picked it back up, took another boat ride back to the Chickahominy, and that one took a trip to the Appomattox, possibly for weigh-ins. So, um, yeah, really interesting to see, though, because the odds of that fish getting caught again and then relocated back to the Chickahominy are really small. Brandon, uh... So we only catch the stupid fish. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, that's a spot on boss. Um, anyway, we'll go to the next slide. I, I would say that uh, fish that are more aggressive are more likely to be caught. Uh, so we'll we'll say uh, they're curious. Not, yeah, not that's, dumb. that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, <laughs> either way. <laughs> Silver uh, linings. Uh, let's see. I think, oh, yeah, I'm on the next slide. This is uh, no, wait, I'll get the next one. Here we go. Perfect. So this is the James, the Chickahominy monitoring. Uh, yeah, so this is just kind of going through um, the other stuff that we have going on in the James and Chickahominy. Um, we, you know, we'll regularly get reports of uh, Alabama bass. We'll go out, we'll monitor. We haven't really found any additional Alabama bass that have been confirmed in the James or the Chickahominy. Um, we're constantly monitoring, though. Um, we've gotten a few reports on northern snakehead. They've turned out to be bowfin, once a flathead catfish. Uh, so we haven't confirmed their presence, but, you know, we always monitor for them. Um, we did in the spring and fall through fall 2023, got some reports of lesions on bass. Um, so that's something that we monitored and we are partnering with VIMS to, you know, keep an eye on the, um, uh, 
health of the fishery in the James and the Chickahominy. Um, it looks like last year it was a combination of stressors from, you know, wonky spring temperatures, a delayed spawn, um, probably stress from, you know, catch and release, um, and, you know, just environmental stressors. Um, so it, it doesn't look like it was anything serious. It was just kind of a, a normal bacteria that's present in, in all of these systems that was able to take hold in a few fish because uh, of some increased environmental stressors. Um, and then the other thing I just want to plug is we're doing a James River and Fall Line Creel survey through February 2025. So if you're fishing the James uh, or out of riverfront and you see one of us uh, pestering you with questions, that's what we're doing. And then as always, guys, uh, when this gets re-uploaded tomorrow, I'll put a link in the episode description to um, for the Virginia Department of Natural Resources, just their website with a lot more information. So you can go there and check it out. Um, let's see. We do have a question on Instagram. Sadly, Instagram doesn't let me stream uh, show off the comments, but it's from uh, Triple Threat Vet. Lesions as in the Adam virus, question mark? No, no. So these, uh, we believe, were caused by uh, Aeromonas and Pseudoaeromonas bacteria, which are very common in all habitats. Um, they are, you know, most fish can can fight them off and be just fine. Uh, it's only when a fish is really stressed that, you know, there's more chance of it actually affecting the fish. And, and in this, and we saw it in blue catfish as well, um, but it just caused like a lesion that some folks were very concerned that it was largemouth bass virus. Um, it was not. And later in the season, um, you know, as time went on and everything kind of evened out, we saw, you know, what looked like healed lesions on the fish. So it was something that we continued monitoring to make sure it wasn't an, is an issue. Um, and it didn't seem to be, we had good numbers in fall. Um, but that being said, that's another thing that we're keeping an eye on because we don't want to, you know, be surprised by a health scare in the population. But uh, again, having reports from the anglers, um, was huge. I mean, I started, I just started, you know, getting a few of these fish in, in my samples. And I was like, this is something I want to look into when I heard from some anglers that were like, what's going on? Uh, and it was actually a huge help to get some fish samples to bring to them. So, um, yeah. When we, when we talk about the spotted bass and this kind of ties into, we got another question that I'm going to add to, uh, Victor, you just want to gift card to Jake's bait and tackle, please, uh, Instagram, Facebook, or email me fishing the at gmail.com. Um, when he talks about the, the data, is it, does it include spotted bass, large mouth and small mouth or just large mouth? Um, the one thing I wanted to add to that is how well do, do the Alabama bass, how well can they actually thrive in a brackish system like the James? And this will also be for like my Potomac guys. Uh, uh, John, I know I've had you on the show a couple of times to talk about this issue. Uh, I also had, um, I also had a couple other people on that those episodes haven't dropped yet. Don't want to spoil that. Is it just those clear lakes like Kerr, uh, fill pot, or can they really get a grass holds root like in the James? I don't, I mean, I, I'm not too concerned about them in the tidal James and the Chickahominy. Um, what seems to be happening is they're, they're holding deeper uh, than the largemouth bass. And I think that's also why we haven't really caught more. I think they're kind of figuring out how to kind of carve up their, their turf. So when we're doing our fall sampling, we're seeing largemouth like up on structure where we would normally expect to find them. But every report that I've gotten from anglers, I mean, they're off, you know, eight, 10 feet of water deeper where, you know, my, my cables aren't going to bring those fish up necessarily. Um, so, it, you know, it seems like they're holding deeper and, you know, there's some kind of separation there. Um, where I get concerned about them is in the James above the fall line um, and, and going upstream. But um, in the Chickahominy and in the James tributaries, the largemouth bass population is so strong. I'm not worried about them out competing them and taking over. Um, but, you know, I'm never going to stop monitoring these guys. It's that's again, that's not something I want to be surprised by. I want to kind of know what's happening. Um, so, you know, we're always going to keep an eye on that, but I'm not super worried about them taking hold necessarily. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. And then guys, just keep your questions uh, rolling in. Um, I think that's, I think I'm on the right slide now. So James and Chickahominy. So yeah, th thank you so much. Uh, that's really, really cool information. Um, do I go to slide nine now? Let's see. Okay. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. So, sorry, that that's a remnant from the, the meeting. Okay, um, so the, the, the York will be um, kind of short and sweet. Um, 
same same thing for these guys um, with the the adult versus juvenile and the catch per unit effort. Um, the map and I is a really hard system to get a handle on. Um, so you know when you see these like kind of lower numbers. It, it, I feel like these graphs don't really represent the Mattapanai very well. Um, and part of that is because you see these pockets of habitat that are just overflowing with juveniles or these pockets where you'll get just like several three or four pounders, you know, all coming up at once. And a lot of them are up in these like no name little tributaries that are kind of, uh, you know, going against um, like incoming tide. And, you know, we'll have like a 10 minute, 15 minute transect and you get nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you hit this pocket of beautiful fish and a ton of juveniles. But then when you put that all together and look at the catch per unit effort for that whole transect, the numbers look really low. But when you kind of look at these different pockets, uh, they're doing really well. And so the Mattapanai is one river where you know, even if I am doing a bias sample where I just want to make sure, you know, the young a year are doing really well, the numbers just don't look that good because the habitat pockets where they are and where they're thriving are just very like kind of isolated and a little separate. So I, the Mattapanai is just kind of a weird system where the numbers are deceivingly low, but, you know, they're they're doing really well there and you can really be surprised by, you know, pulling out some good sized fish. Uh, if you, if you know where to go. The, um, Virginia is blessed with a lot of tidal water rivers and with so many, how do you, do you survey all of them or are there certain things and check marks that you have to hit for it to be a river that is eligible to be surveyed for, for black bass? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, coming up with the, I will avoid uh, getting into <laughs> to the the grisly details of the, the algorithm that helps me pick sampling sites, but I basically use uh, an algorithm that selects, you know, X number of sites from the main stem and then X number of sites from tributaries based on like the size of those tributaries. And so mm -hmm. that's how I have it stratified. Um, and the algorithm is... Um, set up so that it doesn't select sites that are too close together. So you don't get that kind of location bias in what like per year. Um, and also so that these samples and tributaries aren't super clumped together. So you won't have two tributaries right next to each other, get all of the tributary samples for one year. Um, so it's a really smart algorithm and, you know, having setting that up, um, was a huge game changer in making sure that we're getting a representative sample every year. Um, and so, Beyond that, like I can pretty much include all of the tributaries of any size um, into that and it'll have the opportunity to pull from it. Um, that being said, I don't want to have a year where only these super tiny tributaries are getting sampled. So that's where it's stratified from like the main stem to, you know, larger tributaries to the smaller tributaries. Um, beyond that, you know, because not all tributaries are named, some of them aren't even on a map. You'll get in a river and you'll be like, what is that? I want, that looks beautiful. I want to go sample that. Um, and I can do that. And, you know, that I just label as a biased sample. And so I can treat it differently when I'm, I'm messing with data. Um, and that way I can ensure that I'm covering every habitat type. And if I think something's going on in this tributary that I've never seen before somehow, that I can still go in there and figure out what's going on. How many years? Your question? You, yeah, it does. And it uh, gives me so many more. Um, how many years do you want to have samples to really see a pattern form? Perfect world. So... Perfect world. I mean, I uh, I love data so much, so I will take as many years <laughs> as I can. I think, you know, for this, especially because it took us a couple years to really transition uh, to this new design and, and feel confident in it. Um, I, I, I would want to see like five years in a row. Um, so I would say 2023 was the first year where I was like, awesome, we have this dialed in. Um, and a lot of that was because, you know, I had all of these random samples, um, but I, I just, I was still seeing some low numbers and I knew that they weren't representative and I couldn't really, I couldn't really get at why. And so Scott actually uh, brought up, you know, well, what if we have this pool of, you know, you know, biased samples where, you know, we're going in and we're just getting the predators to see how the predators are doing. Um, so we kind of introduced that. So it's it's a bit more like a, a like a hybrid. Um, 
kind of sampling design where it's like, if we're not really sure that we're getting representative samples or we're not really sure that we're hitting what we need to hit, um, weird year, like Hurricane Ian year, we didn't have those samples. And, you know, with all the flows and the temperature drops overnight, we saw all of these adult bass put way upstream into tributary, you know, that weren't accessible to us. And so our samples looked really bad for adult hmm. bass. And we knew that wasn't the case, but because this hurricane had run through and, you know, there was just this environmental variable, uh, we couldn't access them. And so Scott had that idea. And so, you know, when we're faced with stuff like that, it gives us this flexibility to say, I think they're here you know, because of the flows and the temperature, I'm going to go and just make sure that we're all good, you know, and it's just a way of making us feel better too. So that if we're seeing really low numbers, we can go in and make sure that, you know, that's, that is or isn't what we're seeing. So, you know, we always want to be confident that we're capturing what's actually there. And in tidal systems, they're so dynamic that, you know, it's easy to have a turn, a, you know, a hurricane move through and, and be like, well, did they all wash out of the system or are they just hiding upstream? Um, so, yeah. No, that, that, that's fascinating. And, and I want to make sure because I can easily get bogged down and ask a thousand questions. We'll be here forever because uh, I, when I talked to John about getting this thing together, we talked about, you know, collecting snakehead and he, he hit about the tide. And to me in my brain, like that is a big variable because at least for bass fishing, of course, it concentrates them. And, and John mentioned like, well, snakehead will still go up in there. And it's like, oh, OK, so maybe that doesn't affect, you know, surveying snakehead as much as maybe, let's say, a largemouth bass if it's a super high tide versus a super low tide. It's just there's so many things that you that to collect the data that you have to deal with that mother nature will throw at you that that's really really cool um let's see go on to i think this is the next one here which is the uh york river monitoring yeah um so this is kind of just a the same thing just kind of a summary of the other stuff that we're uh we're doing um i mentioned you know having trouble kind of finding young of year again just because that really patchy habitat um, so we're going to go in, you know, do a lot more late summer, fall, uh, young year sampling, uh, just to get a better handle on recruitment. Um, we always have snakehead, uh, monitoring going on. We did have, uh, we did have them confirmed in the Pamunkey, um, in 2021. So far, we've only been able to find them consistently at, at one location, um, which is a really beautiful habitat. Um, and anytime I sample it, it, it is just piled high with good sized bass. Um, and it's the only place we find snakehead too. a ton of juvenile bass. Um, so this is really just a hot spot, uh, in the monkey. And so what we'd like to do is kind of get out and, you know, see if we're seeing any kind of, um, we can document, you know, snakehead spawning in some of these backwater, you know, more vegetated areas, um, that somehow, sometimes we have a hard time getting into, uh, and then we want to do more sampling in the Mattapanai to make sure they're not spread into there. Um, we've done a lot of sampling already. We've never um, been able to catch one in the Mattapanai. But um, again, that's something that we're kind of always on the lookout for. And um, again, the disease monitoring, we didn't have anything reported in the York system. But, you know, once we kind of have that on our radar, that's something we take pretty seriously. So that'll continue for just this kind of monitoring effort for invasives and uh, overall fish health. Um, but that's all I got. Um, we can move on to the uh, Scott and the Piankatank and Rappahannock rivers. Uh, I'll stop talking my head off. No, that was that was <laughs> awesome. And then, as always, please uh, get your questions in the chat. Uh, I'll try to answer the the most topical ones with the slide right away. And then other questions that are that are more broad spectrum, we'll wait till the end because there's a couple of good ones here. But we'll wait till the end for that. Um, Scott, if you can hear me, you're up. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, my internet's been like flaking out like crazy the last few minutes or so. I've been like kicked off like at least three or four times. So hopefully, uh, stay on in a presentation here. So yeah, basically, I'm gonna cover the Pianca Tank. What we did, basically, upper up, upper reaches of the Pianca Tank River, you know, lower end of Dragon Run, and then kind of continue with the Rappahannock. So we can slide on to the next page. Alrighty, let's go right ahead. Yeah, we were uh, we were able to. We were, the hope, hopeful goal was to try to get out there and do four randomly selected sites. Unfortunately, uh, you didn't wasn't able to do that. The salinity wedge was uh, real strong again. That's what happens when you basically have no rain pretty much from mid October to uh, I don't know now you know tail end of October. You know the salinity wedge always wins there on the Pianca Tank River. So we were able to conduct the you know the full community sample runs. You know looking at you know predator species for the most part. You know but we're still collecting everything that we encounter. Um, we definitely have those limitations with our Midwest Lakes electric fishing box. You know, we're looking at about salinity, about three, 
3.5 parts per thousand. And you can't really sample too, uh, too effectively when the salinity is even higher than that in some of the other spots. So we basically had to adjust on the fly, try finding some of the other areas where we've sampled in the past. So it kind of became more of a standardized sampling run, hitting a lot of the areas that we've hit the last couple of years, um, pretty much the lower end of Dragon Run where the blending point is kind of interesting there. So um, next slide, please. <clears throat> And basically, I know this is a primarily targeting and talking about largemouth bass, but everybody knows our, our toothy uh, na native species there, the bowfin. Pretty much the bowfin, uh, you know, been around for, uh, you know, 100 plus million years, and it's uh, basically king of the upper Pianca tank and dragon run. You know, we do have largemouth bass out there, so there are anglers that do catch a fair number of bass. Um, you know, basically a guy with his uh, a nice bass boat and some of a good, decent selection of, uh, you know, bass fishing lures can probably outfish us in terms of what we did last year just because the salinity was creating so many headaches. Um, we've managed to bounce out there for two days of sampling, October 3rd and October 30th, you know, hit seven shoreline sites, you know, combined effort of 2.38 hours pedal time. A lot of, you know, decent species diversity, 18 different fish species collected. I'm um, looking at, you know, just a total of 293 fish. So we didn't really have too much in the way of by, bycatch from gizzard shads and other minnow species along the line. But, um, you know, you do get some centrarchids in the mix. And uh, unfortunately, we we're only able to get a limited number of largemouth bass. And that only accounted for a seven and a half percent of our total fish catch. Next slide. So we do have a question here on Twitter, which is from Tone Tony 98 Are both an endangered species? They are not an endangered species, but they have received a fair amount of pressure over the last, say, five to ten years, primarily from the bow fishermen that are actively targeting the northern snakehead. Unfortunately, some of these guys, hey, shoot first, ask questions later kind of deal. Oh, you, know, you plug a six or seven pound bow in. Guys are out there looking for a nice meal of northern snakehead fillets. They're not out there eating uh, you know, the bow fin. So basically... You know, we've seen a fair number of bowfin in our surveys, you know, arrow wounds, you know, it's through the body. We've seen some of those gaping and gaping arrow wounds where you're just like, well, you know, somebody missed this guy or, or missed this female bowfin. So it's unfortunately they do get hit. People still have the right to bowfish for them. You know, mind you that, you know, the, the creel limit for gar and bowfin, five, five, per, five per person, you know, for each one of those species. And then like during the spawn though, that's, that's actually knocked back down to like one per person per day. So whether or not, you know, they're, they're not endangered, but we do find declining numbers. We have found the declining numbers of bowfin on the, you know, the Rappahannock. Pianca tank's still full of them. There's piles and piles of bowfin in the Pianca tank river, upper parts of Pianca tank dragon run. A lot of them are kind of cookie cutter, you know, two to three, three and a half pound range. If you get a six, seven pound bowfin, out of the Dragon Run or Pianca Tank, that fish is definitely a, one of the larger specimens that are out there. We rarely see, you know, many of that size. And we've had days out there in the past where, you know, boat 300 bowfin, you know, in about an hour and a half of sampling, and uh, you probably see about two, two, two or three times as many that get away from the boat. So they're not really getting hit all that well with the electricity, especially at that higher conductivity levels. Yeah, Je Jesse, you got a good question there, and uh, I'll get to that one in a bit. That's a really good question, Jess, but I'll, I'll get to it. Yes, right. uh, yeah, pretty much looking at the length frequency distribution of the bass we were able to catch last fall on the upper Pianca tank, lower dragon run. Mind you, you got a couple year classes, not much to, not much to write home about. You know, you, you did see limited recruitment. I think a lot of that, you know, primarily is not the best of systems uh, fertility wise in terms of overall productivity. Do have a lot of bowfin out there, so if you're a little uh, four to five inch largemouth bass, you got a lot of enemies uh, left and right here or there that they could definitely consume the smaller bass. Um, spawning habitat not great by any means. You definitely do not have, you know, this you know shallower sandy flat cistern that. So you might have a lot of the bass that are spawning on you know some cypress knees or some down trees or timber, basically that any of the hardwoody substrates. So you're not really finding your typical. You know, you know, nice, uh, you know, sandbar here or there. You know, some of the tidal river systems, you know, even in the Rappahannock, we, we find areas where like, hey, you're surprised by some uh, good spawning habitat and some of the tributaries. But, you know, we were only able to get one decent sized fish about 20 inches or so. So overall, it was relatively slow fall out there. And a lot of that on the heels of uh, that higher, uh, you know, conductivity and, that, you know, higher salinity. So it wasn't wasn't the best of surveys last year. <clears throat> How much does that survey have to do with the higher salinity levels and just the, um, the lack of habitat right. concentration? Yeah, a, a lot of it just that the you know, the draw of the just not having you know 
not being able to shock these fish effectively. And you, we had a couple times, uh, Catherine Lim, she usually helps me out with a lot of my surveys and she can net with the best of them. And when the fish are just dancing all over the place and it's just, you're, 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 you, you, you don't have, you're not, they're not getting shocked for three seconds. They're, they're barely getting shocked for about a half a second. So people that are netting, you know, the two people on the bow of the boat, they have to be on their ball. Like you won't believe in terms of, you know, you know, jumping on fish as fast as they can. If you get a second on a stun, a partially stunned fish, you're, uh, you're doing better than most in terms of netting them and putting them into the live well. So, um, you know, we have, you know, you've heard, you know, some decent reports of some, you know, anglers catching, you know, two, three pound bass here or there, but for the most part, upper Pianca tank, it has shifted. You know, there's only a lot of pound, pound and a half. We have seen a couple five, five and a half pound bass in years past. And we did, when we did have our bass summit, it was kind of interesting. One of the anglers that was there in attendance, he brought back, hey, you know, telling stories, you know, not not rehashing you know, all, the, all the stories of the glory days, but he did, uh, you know, chime in and tell us some good accounts from way back in the day, catching, you know, eight, nine, eight, nine pound bass out of the upper Pianca tank and Dragon Run. So there was better uh you know catches of those you know he was also saying it was like eh, you know 12 to 15 years ago so mind you the downward trend uh you know has you know limited uh capacity in some of these larger fish that are there but um you actually find you know better bass in the three to six pound range on the you know tidal rappahannock below poor royal than we have seen in the last couple of years on the upper pianca tank and i apologize i didn't tee this up but for people that aren't aware does the salinity level affect your ability to shock? I probably should have teed that up for people that aren't aware of that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much the biggest handcuff we have on. I'll talk a little bit just briefly later when I want to cover the Rappahannock stuff. Where a lot of the sites that were selected, we like, you know, show up, I have my YSI. And we're like, hey, let's see what the magic conductivity is and what the salinity is. And you're like, oh, you know, it's like the lower end of Piscataway Creek. You're like, oh, no, you know, not nine parts per thousand. It's like, nope, you know, not going to happen. So then you kind of. You know, as you look, you look at the checkoff list of the different sites that were selected, and you just unfortunately you're like, oh, okay, nine parts per thousand. That's six parts, six six and a half parts per thousand. You kind of make your way further up these tributaries, and you you know eventually find areas where you can sample. Mind you, even at that three to three and a half parts uh, per thousand, you there are you know fair number of the fish that are bouncing away from you. Um, you can find it's a little bit better on the larger size fish, but you're definitely not getting you know wide range of the smaller fish like spot tail shiners and you know, any juvenile gizzard shad that might be in the mix that you know kind of just swim right through the electric field awesome stuff and then i will switch to the next slide slide 17. yeah bouncing on to uh, what we did uh, last uh, last fall looking at what all the different sampling that was conducted on the tidal rappahannock river we had uh, seven rounds of supplemental bass stockings uh, several rounds of those and that was kind of something interesting i'll go into a little more detail about we had the summer electrofishing looking at collecting you know, some more uh, bass for a bass tagging study, as well as uh, while well, we're out there and a lot of the lower end tributaries collecting fish for a Department of Environmental Quality, their fish tissue contaminant testing. So that was kind of something a little bit different this past summer. Um, in 2022, we did a lot more tagging during the spring months and you know, pretty much May through mid June. So that was something we kind of uh, shifted away from that. So we weren't shocking during the spawn on those upper end sites, you know, just below Port Royal. But then we came back with the full community electrofishing and uh, in October we were out there for uh, you know several days sampling. Awesome. And uh, we we're tied mentioned about the you know the supplemental bass stock and that was something we we're gonna try a little bit, you know, just see how it goes. Um, you know, unfortunately uh, those bigger bass that were pictured and you know, got them from Ice House Pond while sampling uh, King and Queen County and King and Queen County right by our hatchery. Uh, had several collections of fish from there. You know, those fish uh, were moved to another lake. You know, the, the club members, the uh, King and Queen uh, Rod and Gun Club, uh, were generous in giving us a lot of the smaller fish, which is good. You know, a lot of those were pretty much, you know, 8 to about six, 8 to 15, 8 to 16 inch range. But a lot of those, you know, five and five and a half, six pounders were moved to another water. On, unfortunately, not the Rappahannock. But we did find you know, a fair number of uh, juvenile bass that were able to bounce to in different stocking areas that we put into the, you know, tidal Rappahannock. That's awesome. And let's see. Here we go. Yeah. And here's one of the days when we were stocking uh, Bruce Lee. Uh, you know, one of the uh, you know, pride and joy of the you know, yeah, anglers of the Rappahannock River. There, concerned anglers, the uh, best anglers of Virginia. Um, he was out there helping us to stock fish. Audubon Marsh and Drake's Marsh. Uh, we were the first stockings. Uh, put 141 largemouth bass in there. That was the early one from April 5th. Um, bass range in size, you know, some some juvenile ones in three inches up to 12 inches. 
Average size was not all that great, you know, eight and a half inches. But hey, we got you know some juvenile fish. We did fin clips on those, um, and we were able to stock them within like you know close proximity to the marsh edge for the most part. You know, mind you, might be a drop in the bucket, but we were able to get some surplus fish that the the club members there, King and Queen, wanted uh, removed from uh, Ice House Pond. Hmm. How many years has has that been stocked in particular? Just for people that just logged in. That, that, that this was the first full blown stocking of doing this uh, this past year. Um, we have used um, Ice House Pond and Walker Coleman Pond for other you know small impoundments in and around Richmond and Henrico. A lot of that's kind of like hey you know it's like hey I got 150 bass and you know okay I'll bring 75 to uh, Deep Run Park Pond the Upper Pond or in Henrico and then stock the lower one as well. So yeah, in terms of the Rappahannock, this was the first time we did a, a full on uh, stocking. Um, of those fish cool that's awesome all right here we go and here, here's just a little bit more on the the sites that we the other sites that we had hit you know baylor's creek we came in there with 131 other fish uh came back uh in june 16th middle of june there in, in totoski creek uh, put only 93 in there so in the mount landing creek mind you uh, a smaller sample size there what was stocked at 81 so in different size ranges of the fish so you know, some of them were pretty small. Some of the max in were hitting about 15 and a quarter, you know, Baylor's Creek, and then 14.3 on the actually the pretty much similar max in there, Toski Creek and Mount Landing. But total 446 bass, so something that, something that who knows that might uh, might uh, contribute to, uh, you know, year class strength here or there. But one of the things in the past that we have seen, you actually see better bass in the tidal Rappahannock in the two to four pound range. You're really not seeing uh, the you know, year class strength, the weak year class recruitment of those pound, pound and a quarter fish. So it's kind of one of those things where it was trying to fill in the gap, so to speak, with the with the supplemental stock. And, you know, mind you, it was the, you know, the four areas of the river that we did sample and some of the other areas up closer to Port Royal. I'll mention I'll talk about this in a little bit. You know, we did see better recruitment up there. So there are areas in the middle reaches, the lower end that definitely needed uh, you know, little assistance. And then we have a great question here uh, from David Smith. Again, guys, please, I got about six more gift cards to give away here. So ask a good question when a prize. Uh, what section of the lower wrap holds the best bass population? Little Falls, 301 Bridge. And so basically, you kind of answered that, but just this is a topical question. Yeah, one uh, like Little Falls area. So one of John Odenkirk's uh, sites up top, you probably have better bass up there. Uh, more consistent population. There are some decent bass that sort of hang around by Port Royal. Do have a lot of hydrilla just on the flats, just down from the 301 bridge. So that kind of acts as an you know, attractive area for bass to hang around. A little bit on the edge of the break line, mind you, when you at low tide, you know, a lot of that hydrilla is basically a you know, foot, foot and a half of water. You know, great for snakeheads. And, you know, the snakehead anglers love hitting that area pretty hard. Um, Tappahannock gets a little too salty down there. So, you know, Mind you that there are anglers that do fairly well in Piscataway Creek, um, you know, so that you get, you know, some five, six, seven pound bass out of Piscataway Creek. But those fish are kind of playing the surfing game with the, you know, the, you know, the, the saltwater wedge slipping in and out. And, eh, you know, so you, you do have a lot of network inter interconnecting channels further up in Piscataway Creek. But ideally, Tappahannock, you know, th there's a reason why they have the croaker tournament out of there pretty much mid-May, the big croaker tournament, because it starts getting a little uh, higher salinity levels, you know, come May to June. So I would basically uh, race, race the little falls. Hopefully that uh, <laughs> answers your question to some extent. I never knew there was a croaker tournament. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyone in the chat message me with details on that. That's a, that blew my mind there. Uh, yeah, we got a couple more questions rolling in now. So we'll go on to the next slide. Yeah, basically, uh, you know, covering quickly what we did in June, we we're out there for four days, uh, sampling, you know, June 9th, uh, 16th, 23rd and 30th in conjunction with the, the bass stockings, uh, you know, lower end trips, we kind of concentrated further on downriver because we had uh, tagged a lot of our other fish the year before. Uh, you know, the northern uh, the northern tributaries pretty much above Drake's Marsh and the main channel sites. So it was like, well, let me try sampling some of these lower sites further down in the river system. And actually, those were the sites that were on the list uh, for DEQ for the collections for their fish. So it gave them a representative sample of the different species they wanted. Mind you. I tagged my bass and I let the bass go and DEQ did not get any largemouth bass, uh, you know, thrown into the rice coolers, but they did get, you know, bowfin snakeheads, you know, it broke my heart, you know, throwing some long nose gar 
into uh you know from a toski creek into the coolers there but that's how it goes and mixed bag other species you know yellow perch crappie so you know what the, the results are not out yet on a lot of the fish tissue testing you hopefully we can get something uh maybe early early june uh, july or something this uh this summer when it comes to those uh, fish that we did send them so i know john and uh, some of the guys out of the Fredericksburg office i think we're collecting fish further up high for them as well <clears throat> sweet awesome stuff let me get the next slide here and boop yeah, but, you know, just touching real quickly about the tagging study. Uh, we, we had, uh, you know, conducted some more surveys in June there in October. Basically, those were on the heels of the fish that we had tagged um, in, in 2022. Um, looking at those lower end sites, um, tag returns in 2023 definitely showed a decline from 2022. How much of that was natural mortality of some of these fish? You do have you know, some tag loss here or there. Um, the the T-bar anchor tags, the foot tags that we inject basically uh, – just below the dorsal fin on the uh, left side of the fish's body, they'll have an individual tag number. So we owe with anybody, Margie had you know, talked earlier about all the tag bass on the Chickahominy. So basically we were looking at the premise of this uh, project, the tagging study to see if, hey, if anybody was coming down from Hicks Landing, so you know, a fairly decent uh, tournament circuit at, out of Hicks Landing. Um, you do have some, uh, some little tournaments out of uh, a couple of other ramps so to see if any of these fish are being moved further up river whether or not they would ever make their way further back down, you know, fighting the salinity wedge that creeps their way up where you do have some salinity that pushes up to Port Royal. It's minimal there, but the lower ends of, uh, you know, Carter's Wharf does get to about three and a half, four parts per thousand during the middle summer, during the fall, it gets a tad bit higher. So whether or not, you know, these fish definitely, uh, the ones that we saw in tag returns, they are, some of them are, you know, getting caught during pre-fishing. There are a few getting caught a couple of their tournaments. They're not necessarily the biggest fish in the world. We had a couple five, five and a half, and six pounders. Most of the bass that we have tagged in the past, you get these cookie cutter two to two and a half pound fish. So somebody, hey, somebody you know, catches it, happy to catch it. Not necessarily going to be in their winning creel for the, you know, their, yeah, their limit. You know, hey, I'm, I had it in my bag and then I culled it, you know, catching in the same, pretty much same spot where a lot of these fish have been caught. We had, we did have a couple bass that were caught um, about, three miles up from Hicks Landing. So whether or not that fish, you know, went for a boat ride, you know, got, got, got to go for a shiny, uh, shiny bass boat ride uh, further up river, who knows, but, you know, I don't think these fish are naturally uh, moving by, moving by their own means that, you know, to any extent, but we definitely do have seen fish move out of their creeks, like Jets Creek, a lot of the tag bass in Jets Creek, they've scooted out of there. So a lot of, they're in their thick during the spring, you know, April, May, June, things get a little warm, a little stagnant for the most part. They scoot on out and we definitely don't see them, you know. So it's kind of like it's always nice to see recaptures in any of our surveys. So you can kind of look back, see how fast those uh, fish are growing. Um, you know, they say hey, it's a year, two years later. So you kind of get an idea. And uh, actually, I just got an email today. Somebody at one angler actually caught two, uh, two tag bass out of Jets Creek. So it's kind of interesting. I got to look at my file to see, hey, you know, when those fish were actually uh, tagged and uh, what the what their initial size was. But one was, uh, I think, like 4.3 pounds. So that one's doing a lot better than most that we actually shocked out of the Jets. So um, it's kind of it's and one of the you know, things we we're doing with the tagging study, looking at the different zones of the study, um, you know, the upper tribs, the main stem areas, and using Drake's Marsh pretty much as a cutoff point. And you get those, those lower tribs and that was kind of the tricky part, finding enough bass to fulfill our tagging needs on the lower end. And, you know, you can shock a uh, shock to a blue in the face kind of deal. And some of these other tribs are just not producing as much down low in and around uh, Tappahannock. So. <clears throat> Let's go to the next slide yeah. here. Yeah. But here, uh, covering the different sites we hit in the fall electric fishing, we were out there for uh, five days, you know, October 4th, 5th, 11th, 12th, and the 19th, you know, we come combined effort of hitting those 23 sites, pretty much ranging from Port Royal all the way down to our furthest end, you know, the upper reach of the Toski Creek. Total effort looking at a uh, 6.38 hours. Um, so we were bouncing around, hitting a bunch of different sites. Unfortunately, some of the other ones on the lower end uh, were not were not conducted. You know, some of those were pretty much mouth of Cat Point Creek. Even some of the lower end sites in Cat Point Creek were a little bit on the, on the salty side. So we managed to push up a little bit further and you know, managed to still can't uh, get on or get on some fish, you know, Menican Bay up high in Cat Point Creek. But Salinity Wedge was definitely a problem last the last fall. So <laughs> we have a really good question here from uh, Gary's Fish Tales. Uh, 
Since it's brackish and tidal, do you ever get saltwater species like flounder? Here in Florida, I usually catch redfish and flounder during the bass tournament. Yeah, we, we definitely do see some saltwater species that creep their way up. Um, be uh, perfectly honest with you, we were out uh, shoot last week um, sampling Pianca Tank River, trying to get a few more striped bass for our hatchery. Mind you, our striper uh, collection was not great by any means, but I was happy as can be, and we got three puppy drum. And uh, you know, I was like, hey, you know, so it's just kind of interesting. April, fish are moving up. Mind you, the puppy drum were, you know, 15 to 16 inch range, but last fall, I didn't see a single puppy drum at all. A lot of the sites we hit. So, you know, they're, they're one of my favorite species seeing those guys and so those juvenile red drum. So it's kind of interesting. The one, uh, one, one, the one had six spots. So I was really excited seeing a little puppy drum. You do see occasional flounder here or there um that that slipped their way up um pianca tank river we ha we have collected you know four and a half five pound speckled trout mind you that you know, they're rare where we're sampling pretty much just uh, below drag and run um but they're definitely uh you do you do find a few saltwater fish that make things a little bit interesting on that end so <clears throat> well like today uh, we were on the james river sampling and uh, looking for more striped bass and got into giant schools of striped mullet so it's kind of interesting where the fall surveys you strike mullet, they'll make their way up and shoot all the way up to like, you know, the barge pits on the James River. But, you know, we're sampling a um, flat out flower to 100 point and you're just, I don't know, about 15, 20. You strike mullet all about two and a half, three pounds. I'll start bouncing. I was like, well, we're striped bass, but it's striped mullet. So who knows? But, uh, yeah, that's, you know, something different on that end. But, yeah, it's kind of fun when we do see some of the saltwater fish to so get that that blending uh, in the brackish water. <laughs> All right, we got, let's see, I think the next one here is cruising the hydrilla. Yeah, this is just a you know, quick idea showing uh, some of the sites that we're hitting. So I think yeah, this was in uh, Jets Creek where you find that hydrilla edge. And definitely you know, if you have a uh, tide creeping out and you're approaching lower tide, you, you're basically cruising along there shocking. You find a lot of fish just targeting along that edge. So um, just in there, not too much behind that, just besides the scene. Uh, you do find some good, good cover in these creeks, especially as you know, closer you get to Port Royal. Finding that hydrilla, great for juvenile bass, just in that whole nursery habitat that's there. Um, Ginkatee Creek, um, just for just to the west, you know, basically the most northern arm, uh, creek arm just below Port Royal. That's got some great hydrilla in there, and it's been one of our more productive areas for, for finding juvenile bass. So it's always great to, uh, you know, see those young fish, whether or not they make it, you know, two, three, four more years down the line. That's a whole other story, and hopefully we'll be tracking them in the future. <laughs> Next slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was talked earlier about, you know, the higher salinities there in Piscataway Creek. So instead, instead of just, uh, you know, putting a big fat asterisk on our data sheet you know, with, the, with the salinity levels, we, uh, mind you, we did record them. We pushed her further away, further up the creek to see, hey, we find some bass up high, you know, some bowfin, occasional snakehead here or there. So it's kind of interesting actually hitting some of these areas, specifically uh, Piscataway Creek and actually Mount Landing Creek, where basically is as far as you can go you know, up to the creek and yeah. In Piscataway, we uh, we found a giant pine tree that pretty much blocked the boat. And, you know, it's like, hey, maybe you have a kayak, you can slip over that pine tree, but not making it any further. So you definitely had to uh, ad lib some of our upper end sites. You know, we actually did a full community on this uh, site, too. So we did find a fair number of uh, bait fish and, you know, sent you know, mixed bag of pumpkin seeds and some bluegill. So you do find, a, you know, different fish uh, assemblage in these upper ends of these creeks. <clears throat> And then you get the just uh, the full community election uh, electrofishing surveys gave a tally of you know fourteen hundred and eight fish so had great species diversity so it's kind of interesting seeing the thirty six different species that we were able to collect um, you know we had one hundred and ninety seven largemouth bass and unfortunately the CPU of that with the amount of effort we had you know thirty one thirty one bass per hour um, cast rate you know takes into account a lot of the poor results from those lower sites so you can't always necessarily if you go to a lake you can't always sample uh, all the beaver huts uh, you know and, and hey you know all the lily pads so you do have those other sites that are worked into our collection um and on the lower end that definitely did take away from our our, our, our full tally you know if i uh, i'm not going to take away those sites and just to bump up my cpu -E, the catch rate there but um, so you're looking at the bass collection comprising you know, 14% of all the total fish uh, we collected, you know, over the, those five days we're out in the Rappahannock. <clears throat> and here's uh, just the length frequency, length, length frequency distribution of the bass we collected. Um, good recruitment coming through, you know, that 2023 year class, boom, a lot of those guys, you know, that three to seven inch range, and you know, bulk of them in that five to six inch range. So you do have a lot of good fish. 
piling on through. Um, you know, the catch rate, you know, not great, you know, just shy of 31, you know, fish per hour. You know, preferred bass, unfortunately, was low. You know, you think you got like 2.8 preferred, uh, preferred bass per hour. That's pretty much a 15-inch bass or larger. We like to use that as an index in terms of uh, assessing the population. But the young, you know, looking at just shy of 23 fish per hour, you know, the PSDs, uh, hanging tight, mind you, that PSD just reflects, you know, that proportion of the fish, uh, the population that's, uh, you know, if greater than eight inches and uh, out of the, you know, the 12 inch fish. But, um, um, so it's basically one of those things where we like to see some better year classes filing through. Hopefully that 23 uh, year class continues to stay with us and push their way down the line. Definitely did not see, I'd mentioned, you know, those 10 to 12 inch fish. You don't see too many of them in that size. And that was kind of one of the things where, uh, you know, we stocked those fish and uh, mind you that the areas that we did have overlap in the areas that we had stocked fish, I did not necessarily see any of my partially fin clip fish. So that's not to say that they're all, they all perished, you know, a couple of days later, but I like to think that some of those fish are still alive and, you know, be able to, you know, check on them in the, in the future, you know, basically that partial fin clip on the left pelvic fin that actually will, will regrow. You'll actually see a little wavy line on that regrowth of that, you know, that fin margin. So you can kind of look at it, like, hey, and so like, yeah, in years, in years, in the years down the line, hopefully you find some of those ones that we stocked. Um, not really looking at, you know, tapping the ice house pond anymore, pretty much because they they pretty much drain that whole lake. So, but if we do find any other uh, sources of possible other bass, who knows? But not necessarily in the works for this year. <clears throat> I think I got, you know, the one more slide here showing the 2022 distribution. I can bounce back to that one. That, so yeah, that's, that, that's pretty much just a, you know, comparison of what we saw the year before. Had a piles of those juvenile fish, four to seven inch range. Had a couple pushing into eight inch range, most likely uh, juvenile fish in October survey. So you do have some that, you know, I didn't take odorless on any largemouth bass the last couple of years. Um, that's something that, you know, when you see a, as limited number of bass as we have been seeing in the lower areas, you kind of feel a little bit guilty. Uh, but, you know, it's in years past when we saw some better numbers of fish, you can kind of get a, you know, represent a sample of uh, the age structure, how the, how the bass are doing. But for the most part, you did see that big slug of those juvenile fish again. And uh, you got a couple larger fish in the mix, you know, 17 to 20 inch range, but definitely did not see the, you know, five, six or seven pounders. So it's, you know, definitely in our fall surveys, we did see them, uh, in our 2022 uh, spring tag, and I didn't display that, but we did see some better fish uh, in the spring survey. So, and then I get one more slide, and that just shows you kind of the breakdown of uh, um, where the areas we sampled. Um, mind you, uh, you know, green means fair to good, um, and red means uh, you pretty much, you can guess what pretty much red means. Um, low numbers of fish on a lot of those uh, lower end sites. Um, you know, PD Creek, you know, disappointed. Um, you do have a lot of, uh, you know, some of the other ones, Upper Hoskins Creek and all that. So definitely more of those lower end sites were kind of, we're tailing off in this sad numbers there. We did do a lot better um, towards the tail end of October, the mouth of Mill Creek. We found a lot of nice bass there. So a lot of good hydrilla that was still hanging on towards the, you know, uh, middle October when we were sampling. So you know, a lot of juvenile fish and definitely had a high percentage of those juveniles looking at what, 74%. So you did Big slug of uh, this juvenile fish making up a strong year class that hopefully will translate to, you know, and so hopefully some better survival rate down the line. And uh, hopefully anglers can be catching them later on. So. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's, uh, we can, then we can transition to uh, Odenkirk and he's got a little bit better uh, results uh, further up river. <laughs> I get the fun spot because, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Pretty strong. Well, well, yeah. So, We've been talking a lot about variable recruitment, your class strength. These are basically the same thing. It's just a fancy way of describing spawning success. Because that, you know, in any fishery, that's what's driving it mostly. Okay. You got three things exerting any influence on whatever population you're talking about, fish or whatever, right? More recruitment, the number coming in, the growth and mortality, how many are going out. If you know those three things, you're, you can unlock any secret you want and describe what the, what's going on, right? And that's what we're trying to do is figure out what's going on. Um, and to me, and, and to most biologists uh, working with fisheries, recruitment is such a key thing. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, recruitment is fine. It's not an issue. Uh, a reservoir is a pretty cushy place to make a living, especially a stable reservoir like Lake Anna or, or a Lake Orange or, you know, whatever. 
But when you get down a river system, everything changes. And then you throw tidal mechanisms into a rivering system, and then it's even more complicated. So you have all these different factors exerting influences on the spawning success of your favorite species. And, and so it's not quite as simple as just saying, well, when the flows are average, we're going to have a good smallmouth spawn. You know, that was easy. But when we get into snakeheads or tidal largemouth bass populations, there's we still don't know completely the drivers. I mean, we know it's related to aquatic vegetation and aquatic vegetation is related to flow, nutrients, uh, precipitation and lake transparency. There's always different variables that come into play. Well, with in the tidal Rappahannock, we had a situation uh, starting about 1998. And then it kind of culminated in 2003 with a lot of really, really angry bass anglers. And Bruce Lee was among the, the, the kind of the top tier that was come to our attention and said, look, man, the Rappahannock's really screwed up. Y'all need to stock fish now. And we hadn't, hadn't been looking at the tidal Rappahannock. You know, we, we maybe had one or two surveys over the last five or eight years or something like that. And we said, wow, well, apparently we need to get out there and figure out what the hell's going on. And so we started surveying the tidal Rappahannock and, and that was um, below Fredericksburg. Basically the fall line for the Rappahannock is Fredericksburg. And then Mike Osles, the other biologist I work with and, and uh, Robbie Willis, and we go down to Port Royal. That's the end of region four, which is the region where I work in. And then you switch over to Scott and, and Margie. So our area of responsibility went to Port Royal. And at that time, there were other biologists working in region one, which is Scott and Margie. And, and so we set up what we called a uh, go ahead and uh, change the slide for me, Thomas, please. Yeah. So we, we set up a sampling regime uh, in 2003. I said 2004, I think. So it was 2003. And what had happened was there were a series of essentially catastrophic events culminating in complete failures of like four out of five consecutive year classes. So like, you know, if we have a one bad year class, Mother Nature, you know, lays an egg one year, that's not a big deal because you've got buffer on either side of that. When you have four out of five that, that, that are failures, then like three or four years down the road, when all those fish should be in the bags, they're not there because they never were. And that was when the problem came up. Now, if you think about it, too, when you think about a tidal system and that variability and all those different things driving it, the further you go down right towards the salinity wedge, it would, where it's more of a, a, a frequent occurrence, that's when things are going to get even sketchier. So when you look at something like freshwater aquatic vegetation, whether it's hydrilla or something native or whatever, they both have the same functional values and they, they work to protect uh, nursery areas and, and spawning refuge and things like that. And so when you have that destroyed, um, as we did, the further we went down the tidal freshwater Rappahannock, it, it was just awful, you know, down in, in Scotty's area. And so, you know, I think Bruce Lee will be one of the first to to uh, admit that for many years, you know, the bass fishery wasn't all that terrible. Well, it was kind of terrible. <laughs> and and what I call the upper tidal Rappahannock versus what Scott just talked to you about, the lower tidal Rappahannock. Um, so anyway, what we did in 03 was we set up six sites. We basically looked and we had like 20 odd miles of river in our in our work area. And we said, OK, we 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 didn't do this in the spring because we had no more spare time in the spring. So we said the fall is a second best window to get a non-biased size structure and, and hopefully abundance estimates on largemouth bass in the tidal system. So we said, OK, we're going to do fall sampling and we're going to do it every we said six stations every three miles. And so these are our six stations. And somebody asked a question a while back about, well, where are the best spots? Well, the way things have been going on the Rappahannock, the best spots are pretty much anywhere you want to fish in, in this group of six areas. And when we do our survey, we're generally within about a river mile up or downstream of these areas. We just shot three 1,200 seconds along the shoreline. And that's our one hour of pedal time. You know, it takes us several hours of work to get that one hour of pedal time. But that's what you keep hearing this metric of fish per hour. That is a key metric, not only for us, but it, nationwide, worldwide, that is a metric to evaluate what we call relative abundance, how many fish are out there. And we've tied relative abundance to true abundance. We know it's, it's a reflection most times, if we're doing our job right, of what's really out there. And so that's the idea. If, if, we're, at, if we're not figuring out a snapshot of what's real, then what the hell are we doing, right? So hopefully we're checking the boxes and we're doing it and, and we can judge trends. And so there's different, you know, Mari touched on the differences between pure random sampling versus this, which is a stratified random sampling. So this is sort of a composite between a fixed site. Again, we, we depending on what the tide gives us, um, we may not be in the exact same reach we were, you know, last year. But anyway, that's another conversation for a different day. 
Um, if I was going to fish any of these, I'd, I'd, I'd fish Hop Yarder Hicks. They're absolute dynamite right now. Hicks probably because there's a lot of weigh-in fish released there, but Hop Yard is, is phenomenal. And for years, um, we didn't see a lot of submersed aquatic vegetation, SAV, anywhere on the main stem right behind it. And it was a head scratcher. You look because fragments were constantly coming down from upriver. And that's when you get into this thing. Well, these rivers are all different. They're regional drivers. So typically, if you have a, a good year class for smallmouth on the James, you're going to have a good year class for smallmouth on the Rappahannock. And if you have a good year class for largemouth bass on the Tottle James, you're going to have a good, you know, it goes like that. But not always hmm. because these systems are dramatically different. The productivities are different. The drainages are different, um, you know, and that gets into nutrients and zooplankton and what's happening when the fish are coming up, you know. And so you just can't make, you know, blanket assertions. But it's nice when you do see regional trends. It gives you some credence that things are occurring, at least in what you think they should be occurring. So, OK, next slide, please. One question that I have just to, yeah. to bore the audience listening right now is we have talked about on the show and I probably talked to you about this agnosium with SAV. <sighs> I had somebody ask me a question two weeks ago that was very simple and honest, which is like, why can't we just plant SAV if it's a problem? And it it was a very interesting thought experiment. Like, what is that issue with that habitat? Is it just water quality that will make it disappear? Is it something that you really, you can't plant, correct? No, planting S SAV in a tile system is it'd be next to impossible and it's just a tremendous logistical Hurdle. I mean, people have a hard time establishing water willow in a uh, car reservoir. Um, you know, a very stable environment, a plant, you go on the shoreline, you can fence it out. Um, there's just, it, it's, it's, it's an overwhelming, um, not to say it hasn't been tried and, and, and it has been tried. And in some cases there's some, been some success, but you know, essentially we're at the mercy of mother nature in, in a lot of these situations. And, and we're going to take what she's going to give us. And if, if that means five years of, of hurricanes and droughts, then that's what we're going to get. And there's not a lot we can do to mitigate that. But as we're going to see here very shortly, Mother Nature is very good at mitigating. When she throws us a turd, a lot of times she'll she'll polish that turd down the road. So, Bumper sticker. There you go. There you go. So so here we go. And, and what I think is, is a really extraordinary scenario. These are these are the averages from the six sites I just showed you. And, and you really can't make up more compelling data. We were starting at ground zero in 2003. I mean, there were there were anglers were right. There were no fish out there because, you know, they weren't there to begin with. And, and it's so it's, you know, we're starting from nothing. And, and, you know, this was not a result of stocking. All this stocking did work in the Chickahominy. It probably would have been almost as good without stocking. But, you know, what the hell? We get some extra fish from stocking, too. Um, and as we're finding out in different scenarios, you know, supplemental stocking, there may be a management action for that that's cost effective and, and uh, should proceed. But in this case, this is all wild fish. Again, mother nature sort of picking up the slack and giving us some good year classes. And it kind of took a while for it to take off, but it really took off. And, and we, so our catch rate this year, if you see that high point way up on the top, 2000 and uh, it was past year, I should say 2023, as we sample in the fall, that represents 94 total bass per hour. And that's astonishing. As you can see, that's the highest we've ever seen in the tidal Rappahannock. It blew away the Potomac, our creeks in the Potomac last year. Um, not quite double, but I mean, it's, it, it's, it was for a lot of years, the Rappahannock couldn't come close to beating the tidal Potomac Virginia side. And uh, as you can see, uh, it just crushed it. Um, and a lot of that is because of these very good year classes that we've had. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And, and I think that these good year classes we're seeing is a direct result of all the aquatic vegetation that we've seen in the last three to four years that we have not seen for almost 20 years in the Rappahannock system. And at, at a, the last, uh, you think Scott showed you the graph with the really good recruitment that he saw in his section of the river, a little below this. So it's really nice that at a regional level, things have been calm enough since 2018, the wettest year in recorded history, uh, that we've had excellent spawns. So that I think the past five years, we've had the five highest catch rates overall. And now the last seven years, we've had five of the highest young of year or juvenile. Okay, they weren't, they're not young of year, they're juveniles because we're collecting them uh, basically. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm thinking the Potomac. Potomac fish are, are, are one year out. These are technically young of year fish. So um, 
we're just evaluating the juvenile index differently because one's fall collected, one's spring collected. So, but yeah, it's, if you look at the graph of the reproduction and the graph of the total abundance, it makes sense. We're having great year classes and our adult, you know, the overall population is increasing. So now is a great time to go fishing in the tidal Rappahannock. I put in it at the hop, at hop yard and I fish upstream about a half mile and I fish down to Hicks. Um, fantastic. Fish the wood, fish the uh, creek mouths on, on outgoing tide. Um, fish the spatter dock, find, fish the hydrilla, and you'll catch all the snakeheads and bowfin and, and largemouth bass you can want. I mean, you get the slam. Uh, shout out to um, Jonathan Levitt, got the slam. And I don't know if they were consecutive casts, but he caught the bowfin, the snakehead, and the largemouth within a very short period of time. So good for him. Jim Johnson, I'm putting you out there on notice that you're going to have to top that. So there's, uh, that's, that's uh, I think I think that's my last slide, isn't it? So, yes, it is. And yeah, we so um, <laughs> it's just a phenomenal fishery on the Rappahannock right now. And uh, just glad to watch it unfold, really. We got a bunch of questions now that I've been holding up that were kind of um, not just specific to one slide. So I'm going to. I'm going to just start letting you guys have it and whoever wants to come off mute and, and answer it, uh, you, you can go for it here. So let's, uh, I think this one is going to be probably you for you, John, but how likely, uh, this is from, uh, blue, bluegrass, I think bluebird. I, I'm not gonna be able to say your name, boss. Apologies. You know who you are. How likely are you to catch a small mouth South of the little falls boat ramp? Yep. So, so we see again, we, we can, I said our catch rate was uh, 94, an hour. Okay. So that means we're six sites, you know, we're looking at five to 600 largemouth bass in a typical fall sample in the week we spend on the, on the tidal wrap, we might see five or six smallmouth. I mean, so, you know, a couple orders of magnitude lower in abundance and typically they're not really big fish Look, up around little falls where those rocks are just upstream from that boat landing, I think is some of the better smallmouth habitat. And there's an individual who has been very successful there catching citation smallmouth for years. And I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen the pictures and talked to them. Um, but, but there are some big smallmouth in the upper section of that river, like, like right around uh, just above little falls boat land. And that first bend up there, I think is from what I've seen on habitat is the best area, uh, but they're there. We don't see them in our samples, but it, you know, mm -hmm. again, we're sampling is not, we're biased against a fish lake smallmouth that time of year that's going to be in deeper water. All right. We yeah. got another downriver. We see a couple juvenile smallmouth. I think last year we saw about three. They were, you know, six to nine inch range. You look at them, you're like, hey, what are you doing down here? You're a little confused. Go back to, you know, <coughs> further up river. And it's like, who knows? But, uh, you know, hang out in Fredericksburg. But yeah, we do find a few, but we have not seen any. 13 to 16 inch smallmouth. It'd be nice to see them, but they definitely just, you just don't have the habitat down low for them. How much of it though, how much will the, uh, the salinity change affect them? And I'm thinking like if you have a tournament out of Lisa or Smallwood State Park on the Potomac and you haul up to DC and bring one back, I mean, is that fish pretty much, you know, KIA or would it be able to survive down that far? Oh yeah, it should be all right. All right. We got the next one. Let's see. Uh, okay. This is a fun topic. I haven't <laughs> talked about it all. That's that one. Uh, I'm mutant. <laughs> High, high and muddy fishing. Do you think the blue cats are going to affect these areas? So, uh, anyone want to talk about the blue catfish? Oh, uh, so uh, I, I work a lot with blue cats, so um, I can I can kind of talk large scale about you know what our data is showing. Um, so we've, we've seen blue cats be on the decline um, for the past several years. Um, a lot of that is because we've seen recreational effort, you know, go up. We've seen commercial effort go up, and that's kind of helping keep that population in check. Um, in the context of, you know, the blue catfish population explosion and then subsequential, you know, decrease, you know, bass populations have gone up and down. And, you know, the James and Chickahominy, you know, bass fish fisheries are still banging. So, you know, it's not you know, blue cats aren't going to come up and target largemouth bass. Um, you know, they target stuff that's really easy. They're omnivores. So they're eating a lot of algae. They're eating a lot of um, invasive snails and mussels, actually, uh, which is cool. But, you know, they do eat a lot of our, our native fish, too. But uh, they don't seem to really focus in on largemouth bass. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the super like the big fish that could take down like a bit like a good sized bass. Uh, tend to hang out lower usually. Um, and 
they just don't seem to move around that much. So there is some going to be some habitat overlap, and I'm sure there's some predation happening, but it doesn't seem to be at a level where it's affecting like bass populations. Do they affect striper at all when it comes to, and because I've gotten this before with, with the striped bass issues uh, that we're facing in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, do, is there any kind of competition there? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, they, they're, they're eating a lot of stuff, right? They're, you know, they are opportunistic omnivores. So they're eating what is easy to get. So, you know, they've done diet studies and we know that they're, you know, they've found stripers, they found allocenes, you know, they've found blue crab, you know, they found sturgeon eggs um, in their stomachs. Um, it seems to, so I'm actually doing a movement study in the the James and the Chickahominy River showing kind of how they move. And we're trying to like line that up with some of the diet work that's been done. And what seems to be happening is they're, they kind of cluster out into these kind of community units where they seem to be focused around um, or like specialized in certain food sources. So not all blue catfish will move downstream and eat blue crab. Um, not all blue catfish will follow allocene runs up to the fall line, uh, but some of them do. So we know that they're eating those native species and commercially important species. Um, we know that it has been impacting them, but that's why, you know, our management goal um, and we work with recreational anglers and we work with commercial watermen um, is to get that overall biomass down. Um, so it reduces that impact, but it also maintains the trophy fishery that is really important uh, fishery for Virginia. Um, so we're really trying to walk that line and make sure that, you know, we're decreasing this impact as much as we possibly can, because they're not going away. It wouldn't be possible to remove them if we wanted to. Right. Um, but we do want to re remove, reduce that impact as much as we can while still maintaining that trophy fishery. And that kind of allows us to have the best of both worlds, right? Where we get that trophy fishery. And in order to, to maintain that, you know, you have to have less competition among blue catfish. So that kind of works out to reduce that predation on our native and commercially important fish. Uh, and as, as always, guys, this is an ongoing drama. And as this goes into season five of the whole blue catfish thing, we will kind of keep you up to date with that. Um, we got Brandon Howe. Uh, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. With kayak fishing gaining popularity and the use of CPR, is that a possible data point? Could that be a benefit of more boat tournaments going CPR? No weights, but length and things like lesions, lessons. Thoughts on anything? Anyone would like to take it? You're more than welcome to. I mean, I'm always for, you know, people being able to access the resource. So, I mean, you know, when I see different ways of, you know, people getting out on the river, I'm um, for it. I think it's awesome. Um, for, for me, I, I love talking to anglers. I love like getting that information. I love hearing from people saying like, uh, I caught this fish here. Uh, I, I think I saw this here. I think I caught a snakehead, you know, that just helps me know what's going on you know, on the ground, I, you know, as many hours as we all spend on the river, um, it's not as many hours as all of, you know, Virginia anglers all together. So um, I say more eyes on the water and more communication, the better. Um, but I don't know if anybody else has comments. Yeah, with the CPR, it's definitely interesting, like, you know, to see what people are catching, whether, you know, a lot of the tournaments, major league fishing, hey, you know, get, you know you're not taking pictures of the fish, but they're weighing the fish in the boat, you know, quick release. So you can kind of definitely that aspect of tournament angling is definitely interesting in terms of not putting the you know, stress on a fish in terms of hey, bouncing around for seven, eight hours and you know, taking it, you know, 55 miles away from where you caught it. So, um, yeah, the kayak anglers, they are, they're definitely hitting the, uh, the Rappahannock river pretty hard in terms of, you know, a lot of recreational, there are, you know, the kayak, uh, you know, snakehead tournaments that are popping up. So a lot of these guys, you know, finding the little nooks and crannies where the snakehead are still present in a lot of the tributaries and you know, some of the grass beds on the Rappahannock. There are other areas that do get worked over by bow fishermen. You know, I won't uh, necessarily uh, throw them under a bus too hard, but, you know, there's certain areas that we shock and you shock for an hour in a certain creek and you see two snakeheads. So you're just like, well, I guess the bow fishermen have, uh, you know, come into this creek and worked them over hard. But uh, it's not to say that these creeks are, uh, you know, totally vacant of a snakehead population, but, you know, it's kind of one of those things where the kayak anglers that are out there definitely can find those little backwater sloughs and areas 
that, you know, the larger boats might not be able to, you know, sneak into. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. When, when you do talk to some of the kayak fishermen and uh, Wilmot Landing a couple of years ago, we were uh, talking to one angler and he was like, uh, hey, and talking about all the snakeheads he catches here and there. So he was also eating a bunch of them and but enjoying the resource in the same in the process too. So it's kind of fun to, you know, talking to these fishermen. Awesome. We got a couple more questions here. Make sure, guys, uh, if you get your questions in, because we're not going to be going that much longer. Uh, we got uh, Gage. Um, in their in their opinion, what are some of the best ways you can keep the stress levels of caught fish, especially early in a tournament environment, uh, to best help the catch and release process after a weigh in? I I take that one. I just read a paper, Thomas, about uh, live well additives. And the, uh, the result of that paper, I can share with you if you'd like to see it at uh, some point, you can share it with whoever else. Um, they're basically a waste of time and money. Um, bottom line is if you want to keep your fish healthy, use recycling, recycle your water constantly. Fresh water in, uh, you know, old water out. And then don't fish when it's hot. Um, you know, fish, the, the, the stress that fish experience is directly proportional to water temperature, which is inversely proportional to oxygen capacity. So just, just self-limit. I mean, people always ask us, why don't you ban tournaments, you know, in August or when the water's like, you know, 80 to 90 degrees or more? Um, we don't want to have to do that. You know, people should be smart enough to regulate themselves and not stress fish in the times when they're going to be stressed most. So just cycle fresh water and um, fish when the water's not too hot. At what temperature do bass, is there a threshold? Is it 80 degrees, 60, 100? Is there like a range where it's like, this is a little too much? Large, large mouth are a warm water fish. So, you know, they'll tolerate better temperatures than small mouth, which are considered a cool water fish. Um, you know, I, I'd start to get queasy about carrying bass around in a tank when it gets up into the 80s, um, especially the you get past the mid 80s, definitely. Um, but anything up into the 80s, I, I'd start to be pretty cautious about. Awesome stuff. And yes, I would love to to look at that paper. Yeah, I'll, and, I'll make a note and send you that. And break it down. Uh, let's see. We got Joshua. Joshua, you just won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Please message me on Facebook, Instagram, or email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Uh, what bodies of water do you guys stock the F1s? And how long does it take for those to take off uh, with population growth? Um, like I got a little back, background perspective on that. We have a largemouth bass stocking policy that a guy named Vic Desenzo wrote about <laughs> a long time ago um, before he left to go back and get his Ph.D. And then anyway, um, bottom line was we decided a while ago that when, whenever we needed to do any largemouth bass stocking, we were going to use F1s because in most of Virginia, largemouth bass aren't native. Um, and what we've got now are a bunch of mutts. In other words, the percentage of Florida alleles in the population varies from 20 to 30 percent up to 80 percent in most cases. Most cases it's in that range. Um, so we've got a bunch of what we call FXs. They're mutts. They're back crosses. They're not northerns. They're not Floridas. They're just mutts. Um, and so there's there's some data that show that the original back cross, the F1, the, the first generation of a pure northern and a pure Florida can provide some incentive for enhanced growth, maybe a uh, bigger top end. Uh, and, and then once they breed with whatever else of FX is in the population, then they're FX, everybody washes back out. So we, we, so we decided that it was for our policy as the agency was gonna be, if we needed to stock anything, whether it was to remediate a fish kill, whether it was some, a new reservoir, which isn't very common anymore, or for whatever reason, we, we were gonna stock F1s. Uh, and we generally have proceeded along that path over changes in administration and changes in leadership. And it was also for a long time, you know, it was deemed irresponsible almost to stock remedially stock black bass because most of the literature out there showed that that was abject failure. The Chickahominy changed a lot of that. We pushed back against the Chickahominy stock for years because we didn't think it was a wise investment. And like we said, we work for the anglers and we want to waste the anglers money. Because right now they're the one paying us. But, you know, we were kind of forced to stock the chick because they gave us money to buy fish. How do you say no to that? Right. Um, and so we stocked F1s and the chick and it might have been the best remedial, the most successful remedial stocking, at least in the published literature to this date. Um, we've tried to replicate that in other cases and it didn't work. Um, so it works sometimes and not in others. So what we're doing now primarily is, is we're looking at Lake uh, five different large reservoirs in the state to see if this 
enhanced stocking can result in a top end. What we're trying to do is see if we can get the bags at Anna, you know, going from routinely now in the low to mid twenties, can we get those pushing 30 pounds and over maybe uh, in another five or six years? So it, it, this is something to, to watch and see. Um, and it may have implications for other management in other waters. Uh, but we're working on it to see if it's something that, that might be, you know, doable. I know this is anecdotal, but last week I just interviewed um, the, Shenandoah, the Shenandoah Division BFL winner on Smith. And I looked back at the BFL stats. It took usually 17 to 18 pounds about 10 years ago to win. The last four events over the last couple of years have taken 27 pounds. It's it's a hell of a jump in weight. And that's Dan Wilson is the biologist that's down there managing that fishery. And he's the one that got pushed into the corner, just like the chick when, when the Smith mountain Lake people wanted us to stock. And Dan said, no, man, it's, it's not a good use of money. We've already got all these natural fish and they, they handed him a check. And okay. So we could, we know now we have genetic markers on those fish. We know for sure, because that's the thing to evaluate any stocking program. You have to know with utmost certainty, is that a stocked fish or is it a wild fish? Mm. Well, in the old days, we used to have to do all kinds of wacky stuff, which we don't have to do anymore because of technology. And so we just take a fin clip, send it to a lab, pay like 20 bucks or whatever, a sample. And they tell us, yeah, that was one of the F1s you stocked two years ago, three years ago, whatever. So that's really nice to be able to have that. And Smith Mountain started way before any of these other reservoirs. Scotty's got a couple of them. I got one, Lake Anna. Um, and, and so because Lieutenant Dan... Dan Wilson got a jump on this thing that his you're, what he's seeing now is probably not. We don't know for sure yet, but it's likely that that is maybe the F1 contribution to those bigger bags. And it's definitely not happened at Annie yet, but it, it probably is a Smith Mount. When will you when would you know it, just to confirm that? Uh, well, let's, we could do Anna, but Anna and Smith. Uh, well, the genetic contract's a huge pain in the butt. And Dan's been waiting for samples for almost a year. And we're still trying to get them back from the lab. So, um, yeah, well, we should crazy. know. We, we Dan should know relatively soon. <laughs> I hope. I think people need to know that because they appreciate it. Like the, all this stuff takes time. And when people get impatient online or, or in forums, I mean, just the fact that it would take a year just to get the, the information back from the lab. I mean, there's so many things that you have to almost hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. And, and yeah. I think people listening need to understand the context of that. It's so important. Let's see. We got uh, we got a couple. We got four more questions left, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up. Uh, Jesse Kurt, what can wreck anglers do to improve largemouth bass fishing in these tidal rivers? Scott, you got anything? You look quiet there. Yeah, pretty much echoing what John said about limiting you know tournaments during the hot summer months. Um, remind you that the tidal rivers might not get as toasty as. Lake Chesden a couple of years ago when we get 93 degree surface temperature water, but you're still getting those 85 to 88 degree range, you know, middle of July, August. So yeah, not like most of these rivers don't have night tournaments. I know Chickahominy Lake, they definitely have a few tournaments there out of Ed Allen. Hey, night tournaments. I'm like, well, maybe the water temperature cools down a little bit, might uh, alleviate some of the stress on those bass that are caught, but Definitely, uh, you know, limiting your amount of fishing during those hot weather periods. You know, it's kind of one of those things where, hey, you still got the itch to go fishing during the summer months. Maybe you get out there for, you know, two or three hours, you know, six o'clock to 830 or so and you know, catch a few bass. But, you know, when it's cranking, uh, you know, 100 degree day and uh, you're catching fish, you definitely don't want to hold on to them too much. Always try to practice you know, as best the uh, proper uh, handling of the fish and wet hands, uh, limit the amount of time that bass is spent, you know, in the air. So, you know, so, you know you know, high and dry, so to speak, you know, and, you know, try not to boat flip them, you know, everybody like, hey, hey, and boat flipping, you know, two, three, four pounders into the boat as it bounces around on the carpet, this and that, but if at all possible to, you know, try to limit that amount of uh, stress on those fish. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where we're not preaching, you know, don't fish during the spring months during the spawn. I know people do catch some nice bass during the spawn and maybe not necessarily seeing those bedding bass on the, any of the turbid waters, uh, you know, the Rappahannock, this and that, but, um, you do, it does, you know, you, you still have good recruitment, even though when people are fishing during those, uh, in the spring months, but you know, you know, you, you, you put a, you catch a six pound female and you take her for a, you know, 20 mile boat ride here or there. It's like, you know, she's not necessarily going to be coming back down to the green Bay flats anytime soon. So kind of one of those things where just kind of limit the, uh, when you're fishing at certain times so that you know, could put obvious stress on those fish. 
Awesome. Yeah, I'll just say to reiterate, like both of you know John and Scott's comments is like we, you know, we never want to be in a position where we're trying to like regulate when and where people are fishing. We don't want to do seasonal closures. We don't want to do any of that. And you know, to be honest, um, bass anglers have a really strong conservation ethic generally, and a lot of you know the stuff that has you know come around you know to increase fish health and tournaments has been driven by the community, and so. You know, we don't really see a need to to go there and, you know, policing live wells is the last thing that we want to do. And so I think just being responsible, keeping your water clean, you know, doing your best to keep bass healthy is is huge. And, and that's so important. And again, and this is what I said when we've had river keepers on. If you're out there, if you see something, say something, take a video. If you see, think that something is, is a miss when it comes to the environment, a spill, it, it's so important to be able to do that. I mean, it's 2024. You have an iPhone 25. It can take really good video or picture. Don't just come back to the dock with, oh, this is what happened. Just take it and you can send it up the chain of command. Uh, let's see, we got a couple more. What was the last one from? Oh, this is a, this is an interesting one. Um, from Jesse, Jesse, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me, uh, Facebook, Instagram, or email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Uh, how is the relationship with Maryland DNR, the DC version, um, in regards to completing surveys? Is Jesse Kirk the real name? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Now that, that's actually a great question. Um, so for, for many years at times, Virginia fisheries management and Maryland fisheries management have had some philosophical differences in um, interpreting data that, that they have in hand and have um, opted for different ideas about management strategies is about as kindly as I can say it. And um, that led to some consternation among certain areas and in an effort to try to work together and provide anglers with a better service and a, a better comprehensive, cohesive message. Um, a number of years ago, Virginia and Maryland and DC started working together. Uh, and that's when we're out there, we were all tagging bass this year, um, all three entities and, and is a, is a regional project to, is this the upper title Potomac system we're speaking about. And, um, uh, to try to get a better handle and share information, share data. And, um, you know, so I think one of the, the benefits to come out of that is, is that Maryland is doing electrofishing surveys now at a, at a time of year when we're out there on the water. So we're seeing similar things. And I, I think that we're being able to pool our data, our information. And, and so it's a good thing we're working together now. And I think that it, things the lines of communication are better and, uh, we're able to help each other. And, you know, because the constituents don't care, you know, they're crossing the borders all the time and they just, they want to hear, you know, they want to hear what the status is of these fisheries. And so I think we've taken a pretty big step forward in, in coming up with a plan that will let these three different management agencies bring a result that, that, that is, is transparent and, and comprehensive and in agreement among all, the most important things. I had a uh, I had Martin Gary on who is the executive uh, secretary for the Potomac River Fishery Commission before he moved and it was just the bureaucracy thing of like how the Potomac is split up from like you know three organizations I mean even that can be frustrating even if everybody's on the same page it it, it does make it very challenging when you have those kind of crisscrosses into it um so yeah I, I completely understand like sometimes the frustration with it uh, we got another good question here. We got two more, and then I think we are we are good to go. Um, I'm not going to even try to pronounce your name, so apologies there. Is there a write up? Uh, is there a write up of the major tidal rivers in VA, like Potomac, Nottoway, Shenandoah, James, something like that? Um, so, well, it, what happens is is we compile reports every year of our data. So that best person, the best thing to do would be that person to reach out to each biologist that works if the area, his area or her area of interest and say, I fish a Shenandoah. Can you please share with me your most recent federal aid report? And in every, every district does it a little bit different, but there's still some information that can be relayed that would be a value to somebody like that. And so, you know, that person should just reach out. There's, there's no place. Well, a lot of the information is on the website. If, if they go to the website and click under biologist reports or more information for that water, frequently there will be some stuff on that website. 
Um, but if it's something that's not there or they want to see if there's more recent stuff that maybe hasn't made it to the website yet, because we're not all the greatest about getting all our stuff to the webmaster in a timely fashion always, um, that they could reach directly out to the biologist responsible for that water of interest and we could provide any information. And, and then I also guide you guys to uh, the department's Facebook page uh, that I know they have. They might have an Instagram for updates when that information does get refreshed as well. Uh, let's see. We got this is a fun one. Uh, John, you might want to take this one from Jacob M. Have you all thought about adding smallmouth to Gaston to create a mean mouth population? <laughs> I'm going to refer that to uh, Dan Michelson. He manages that lake. <laughs> And uh, he's not on here now, but but um, yeah, c contact Dan Michelson. He works out of the Farmville office. Well, Gaston has all the problems with the Alabama bass, and they're just like you know taking over. Like you won't believe down there. I've talked to fishermen. And they're like, yeah, hey, caught thirty Alabama bass. You know, fishing for crappie just on crappie jigs, and a lot of these Alabama bass and Gaston, you know, these ten to twelve inch fish. So. You know, they are eating them. It's like, mind you that, you know, an Alabama bass actually you know, tastes way better than a largemouth bass. So I, I, I can I can recommend that. So if you, you do catch one and you're worried about, uh, you know, populations, this and that, you know, eat, eat the Alabama bass and don't, don't throw it up on the bank for the raccoons. Um, but definitely, uh, yeah, ga Gaston is kind of one of those things where, yeah, population, we are, are seeing Alabama bass now in Bugs Island Lake, you know, Dan Michaels yeah. and those guys. So, you know, Johnny Fishy, they didn't magically uh, hop their way over the dam there and get into bugs, but uh, the people are moving fish around. We don't want people doing that. So that's definitely a problem. And uh, you see uh, Johnny, like Johnny Fish Seeds uh, working uh, all over the place. So you got to be careful on that. Um, I mean, John, I've talked to you about this. Um, I've talked to uh, an individual down at Auburn University that episode hasn't dropped yet. Is it true that Alabama brass and smallmouth, when they do cross though, that becomes, they become sterile? Like it will push the smallmouth to extinction, correct? Well, yeah, but not, not through sterility. They're basically just going to, they're, they're going to outbreed and it's, they're going to, they're going to become more of a mutt. And so that, and that the, that's going to keep exacerbating and the, the small, there will be no more pure smallmouth, but they're not sterile. Good stuff. Good stuff. And then last question of the night. We did it. Um, let's see. What's the deal now with Ch uh, with Chesden and crappy last fall? DNR said don't throw back as there was way too many. Yeah, with with Lake Chesden, it does produce some larger fish. Some of those crappie, mind you, are hybrids, the black white crosses. Um, people catch occasional two and a half, three pounder. I think the biggest one I've had my hands on just a uh, two and three quarter pounds. Definitely was a hybrid piles and piles of juvenile, smaller black crappie. It is, they, they definitely hit the wall about eight, eight and a half inches. Um, and we have seen some fish that I aged out, you know, odorless structures, 14 and a half year old fish, you know, eight and a quarter inches. So I, I, I jokingly, you know, air quotes the, the bug eaters. So those fish are definitely not converted over to actually chasing juvenile bluegill or even the you know, juvenile gizzard shad. They're just sitting there eating macro invertebrates their whole life. Or they're like, oh, it's like, oh, I ate the one bluegill, you know, two years ago. It was amazing. I'm just going back to eating dragonfly nips. Um, so it's kind of one of those things where we, you know, people, you still have the 25 crappie per person down there. It's not an open, uh, you know, you know, krill limit. But if people do want to eat those eight, nine inch fish, we recommend that. If you do catch larger fish out of Lake Chesden, primarily, you know, those two, two and a half, three pound fish, those are some of the great brood stock. It's definitely would like to keep those in the system. That's not to say Chesden, I think somebody got about 313 a couple of years ago. There was a 39 and a 313 caught a, within about a week and a half, two week period there, upper parts of the lake. So when it comes to the smaller crappie, you know, hey, get us, get us, get a sharp fillet knife and go to town on those eight to nine inches, and you gotta make make your crappie burgers. You're not gonna need a, you know, make some fish tacos along the way too. But we definitely want people to eat some of those, and a lot of people don't want to mess with them, and so they uh, wait and wait until they catch a you know, twelve or thirteen inch black crappie, and that's not necessarily uh, the case down there. Some of the tournaments they're hitting down there, you know, the Richmond Crappie Club. Some of those guys got dialed in with their forward facing sonar. So they can kind of figure out yeah, where some of those bigger fish are holding this and that and that, you know, catch them accordingly. But, you know, sometimes uh, I went to the tournament way in that they had last year at Seven Springs Marina. And I was just like, yeah, hey, yeah, telling people you got to eat those eight, nine inch fish. And they looked at me kind of weird. And it's kind of one of those things where when it comes to those smaller fish that are stacked up there and uh, um, definitely, uh, I wish I had a nickel for every uh, eight inch crappie in Lake Chesney. <laughs> 
Thank you guys so much uh, for all your questions. And, you know, I'm really proud of my audience for for staying here so long in the night um, for, for a very, very in-depth uh, episode. Uh, do, do you all have any closing thoughts? No, not really, Thomas. Thanks, thanks. No, yeah, thanks for having us, Thomas. Thank you. Um, thanks again for coming on. I mean, I, I really appreciate this. As always, guys, please link in the episode description to I'll re-upload this tomorrow morning. So it'll be available on Apple, Spotify, Our Heart Radio, Amazon Music, and as well as YouTube. If you have any questions, link in the episode description to everything DWR related. If you uh DNR related, my apologies. Old habits die hard. And any questions besides that, please reach out to me and I'll hopefully get them answered. Like and subscribe to the channel and we will see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.